So uh, thank you very much. It's an honor for me to introduce our speakers of today. Um, we have Eero Rautalachti, and you hear already he's not a British citizen and he's not of British origin. That is Finnish. Uh, he studied law in Helsinki and allow me here to say he was one of the most active ELSA activists uh, after we have established this student organizations long ago. Um, Eero is a lawyer. Uh, he is named several times to the one of the top 50 equity lawyers uh, at the capital market in the city of London. His first capital market transaction was the privatization of British Petroleum several years ago. Uh, he has since advised on securities offerings with listings at the London Stock Exchange, New York, uh, Nasdaq OMX, Exchanges, Helsinki, Stockholm, Tallinn, and even Istanbul. Uh, of course, he always was partner in the leading international law firms, especially American law firms, uh, like Curtis Mellet, Prevost, Ellen Overy, and others. He still has a non-executive uh, director position in a company listed at the Nasdaq OMX First North since 2017. It's a biotech company. Uh, of course, he has published a lot of publications to finance uh, capital market issues. Jonathan Blanchard Smith, our other speaker, he is an executive and management consultant, but he has worked extensively in the field of political strategy. And allow me also to say he was the chairman of the Reform Club. For those who know something about London, these London-based clubs are very prestigious and I think the, long, the Reform Club was even, is even one of the most prestigious and important. And for those who read this book around the world in 80 days, this story starts at the Reform Club and ends at the Reform Club. But it was before your chairman period. <laughs> uh, his political engagements are by their nature, of course, confidential, but it includes, for, it, for example, an advising on a leadership contest for one of the leading major political parties in the UK. And I just asked him, what does a leadership contest of a party mean? In difference to our political parties, normally you don't know who will become a new chairman of a political party in the UK. So there is a contest who will become a new chairman of a political party. And for those of this chairman, I understood you were responsible. Uh, <laughs> we don't ask who. Um, of course, uh, he also was deeply involved in a European election campaign. He was coaching prospective, former and existing member of the British Parliament. And he still is chairman of the Natural Resource Forum in London. So when we have prepared this discussion, the two gentlemen will, after the first course, uh, present their views together. Um, it will start with a more political point of view that we understand, and that's not easy, what's going on in the United Kingdom. And um, the problem is that from time to time we know less than we thought we knew already one week ago. Uh, so we start with a political view and then we enter the more legal aspects. Um, so, and that will happen after this first course. Bon appetit. Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Um, thank you very much for inviting us uh, to, uh, to talk with you today. Um, there are 
uh, a number of, of uh, codicils I must make at the beginning. The most important is that we are talking about our facts as we understand them now. As of one, a quarter to one Viennese time. Um, things have been moving so fast in the UK um, that one has to make this contingency. We were at a meeting a couple of days ago. Uh, the meeting started uh, when Theresa May walked into a, uh, uh, a meeting of backbench MPs. Had that gone badly, then when the meeting ended, she would have been looking for a new job. And as it happened, when the meeting ended, we could check our blackberries and go, and the Prime Minister is still there. So, in light of everything that has happened in the UK in the last little while, I thought it might be useful just to give you my takeaway right at the beginning. We consider that as a result of these events that have been taking place, a hard Brexit, as is generally understood in the press, is less likely than it was before the election. We consider that a soft Brexit is considerably more likely than it was before the election. But we also consider that a disorderly Brexit, in other words, no agreement, Britain in 18 months time falls out of the European Union, devolves to WTO rules only, is also significantly more likely. In order to explain that dichotomy, I have a quote which is useful and new. Um, you will have seen that the British government has predominantly remained the same after the election. There was no great reshuffle of the top characters, but a number of people have been brought in at the lower levels. Michael Gove has been re-brought in as, of all things, Environment Secretary. Um, Oh, his position is well known. So now Michael Gove and Boris Johnson, both of the people who led the Leave campaign, are in government. And a man called Steve Baker has just been appointed to the Brexit department. And his statement illustrates the dichotomy of the British position. So I want to read it to you and then maybe discuss briefly why we are where we are and what this position actually means. He said, we need a good clean exit which minimizes disruption and maximizes opportunity. In other words, we need the softest exit. Everyone breathes a sigh of relief. Consistent with actually leaving and controlling laws, money, borders and trade. Now, <laughs> Thank you. You see the problem. Um, and this points to the essential issues within Britain at this stage. The election we've just had, 80% um, of the votes went to parties that support Brexit in one way or another. Uh, a single party attempted very bravely to be an anti-Brexit party in the hope that it would um, collect all of the votes of those people who were in fact anti-Brexit, which as we know is roughly half the country. Looking at the way the votes distributed, the 48 to 52, they were hoping to pick up that 48%. They didn't. They improved their electoral position by four seats. The United Kingdom Independence Party, which was very confident having been one of the main instigators behind Brexit was very confident of hitting, uh, getting into the Houses of Parliament, utterly vanished. Interestingly, we were expecting it to utterly vanish. Uh, let's assume a far right wing party is going to fall into the less right wing party, was what we assumed was going to happen. And to be fair, what the Conservatives assumed were going to happen as well. And they assumed they were going to pick up all of UKIP's 3.3 million votes and race ahead into an, uh, an indomitable position against the Labour Party. What in fact happened is that UKIP's votes went pretty much cleanly 50-50 to Labour and to uh, the Conservatives. This has produced a very interesting position in the House of Commons. 
You have a number of minor parties, the Scottish National Party, incidentally, which used to have a, uh, a very important 56-seat voting bloc and owned Scotland, has also lost significant numbers of seats to the, um, uh, both the Tories and to Labour. The Tories are now on 42% and 318 seats in the House of Commons. Labour is on 40% and, because of the way our electoral system works, 262 seats in the House of Commons. For, Lab for the Tories, this is the best result they've had since Margaret Thatcher. For Labour, it's the best result they've had since Tony Blair. Under normal circumstances, either of those parties would actually be in government. But because the rest of the parties have gone down and given their votes to the major parties, all that's happened is that these major parties have gone up. The problem with having 318 seats is that a majority in Parliament is 326. Um, ish. As a result of which, um, the Conservatives are currently in discussion. They announced some time ago that they had come to an agreement. Uh, the other side said they hadn't. Then they said, OK, no, oh, quite right, we haven't. And then they said, we're going to have one by Tuesday. And today is... Tuesday, and they're now saying they won't have one until next week. The Conservatives are seeking to uh, form an agreement with uh, a, very, a small regional party called the Democratic Unionist Party from Northern Ireland. The DUP commands 10 seats from Northern Ireland. Sinn Féin commands 10 seats from Northern Ireland. All the other minor parties, again, have fallen away. Sinn Féin is interesting. Sinn Féin does not take its seats in the House of Commons in opposition to the imperial and colonial occupation of Northern Ireland by Britain. If they chose to, they would actually make a really significant difference. And whether they do choose to or not is going to be an interesting point. Where does this take us with the Brexit negotiations? Michel Barnier has loudly and publicly said he would like to start negotiations now, if you don't mind. He has said in a pool interview uh, published today that whilst Europe has extremely carefully laid out its uh, stall in a number of published papers, all agreed by the EU27, gone through the Commission, appointed negotiators, the British have published a single white paper and sent him a six-page letter. They don't know who their negotiate, negotiation team is, and they don't know uh, when negotiations are going to start. We are currently in the position where we are at least having talks about talks, which is a start. I think there are a number of reasons for this. Firstly, we weren't expecting the referendum to come out like it did. The referendum was a political play in order to attempt to unite the Conservative Party by kicking the issue of Europe into the long grass for the next 30 years by having a referendum going to the country and then saying, well, the country wants to stay in Europe, so we'd better shut up. In an act of supreme political hubris, we assumed we, the Conservatives, I'm not a Conservative, but we, assumed that, because it's obviously logical, because Europe is obviously a good thing, that that referendum would produce a massive majority in favour of staying in Europe. We know what happened then. Suddenly, there is no policy. There is no policy because the result wasn't expected. A certain amount of chaos descends upon the British administrative system, Prime Minister resigns immediately. We then transfer power to Theresa May, who is attempting to find a negotiating position within her government, which is split by um, uh, hard Brexiters, soft Brexiters. And in an attempt to improve her position and incidentally destroy the Labour Party with its extremely unpopular leader and its crazily uncosted socialist policies, she goes to the polls expecting, as indeed we all did, that she would increase her majority 
and she would then have be at least be in a position to have some kind of policy going forwards, which, as we know, isn't what happened. You don't ask the British people to back you in an election. They don't. There is a golden example in 1974 when the then Prime Minister called an election explicitly on who governs Britain. When he got defeated, it was fairly obvious that it wasn't him who governed Britain. Um, it's not a question you ask. So the political scenario, the political situation continues confused. It continues on a week, day by day, hour by hour basis at some stage. We can say things about what we know our position is exemplified in Greg Clark's statement. We want to leave, but we want to be close. We want to trade with you, but we don't want the four freedoms. We want to maintain our position as a finance centre, but we don't want to be subject to the governance of, of your laws. That fundamental inconsistency is something I want to return to, but I'd quite like to return to it during the questions. Good afternoon. Um, I have the sort of thankless task to try to give you a, an idea about about what is happening on the legal side and particularly competition law side. Um, I will probably fail in that task because whatever I can say is, is largely speculation based on what we know at the moment. The political situation will is, is unsettled and that probably means that whatever comes out of this, whatever I'm going to say to you today is probably going to be proven wrong, um, but I will try. I also need to make a point that I'm not a competition lawyer, so if you want to ask me detailed questions about competition law, I probably won't be able to answer that. Um, the, uh, there is a um, UK government white paper about legislating for United Kingdom's withdrawal from the European Union. That was published in March this year. And that gives um, an idea of what the government is, the current government is thinking about the, le the legislative framework. And it's actually quite an interesting read in many ways. Um, as a background to that, I would want to say, as my personal opinion, that it seems to me that the leave, leave aside of the campaign referendum campaign, subsequently, the people who are in favour of Brexit seem to have had a rather hazy notion about the EU law and how it operates. The, under, the proper understanding of the EU and its functions and its organisation and how it operates is almost exclusively, as far as I can see, in, in, the, in the Remain camp which makes the task for the government particularly difficult. Um, to give you an example of how hazy the notions are, um, particularly in the wider public, is that a, there seems to be this sort of perpetual misunderstanding about the European Court of Human Rights and the, and the Human Rights Convention, which comes up all the time in the UK in the public discussion as being saying, yes, well, we want to get rid of the, the, the European Court of Human Rights. Well, it's nothing to do with the EU. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. But even, even sophisticated people in the city just have no idea that these are completely different things. Coming back to the, <coughs> to the white paper, the, 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 what is being proposed is what the government calls the Great Repeal Bill which is a designed, that the main, in, main content is the repeal of the European, European Communities Act of 1972, which gave effect to the EU treaties in the UK and provides for the supremacy of the EU law and binds UK courts to the rulings of the European Court of Justice. Now, that is the only thing that they are proposing to repeal by this. And I would personally feel that it's probably, rather than calling it the Great Repeal Bill, it should probably should be called the Great Retention Bill, because it, it, it made, it, its main impact will be to convert all existing EU treaties 
directly applicable UK EU law as well as all the, the, the past case law directly into the UK domestic legislation. So the idea is that on the moment of Brexit, the, the whole body of 40 years of accumulation of EU, EU law will arm block move in, into UK domestic law, which is a neat solution when you look at it. I don't know whether it actually works. The, <coughs> the white paper also assumes that there's going to be a delegation to the government to, um, to fix things that no longer work, because obviously EU legislation will have a number of things that no longer work when, when the country is a part of the EU. And so they would be sort of delegating that to secondary legislation. Whether that's politically appropriate, I am not the right person to ask. Um, but if you look at just one example of how the, this particular structure is going to be supposedly working, they, if you look at the Brussels Convention on the Recognition of, uh, of Foreign Judgments within the European Union, which is, has been there for a long time, it's a firm part of the EU law, um, following the Great Repeal Bill, Great Repeal Act, as it's going to be, um, the UK will continue applying Brussels Convention unilaterally. So, an Austrian court judgment can be, can be enforced directly in the UK. Now, what makes one think that the EU would give the same benefits to the UK? That's up to the, up to the, up to the EU to decide. So we don't really know where this is all going to go. We know that the UK wants to, wants to preserve all the UK law going forward, or the EU law going forward, and then eventually perhaps pick up certain areas where the, 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 the two legal systems are going to diverge. But by and large, they want to keep everything as it is at the moment. Um, in terms of the legislative initiatives, going forward after Brexit, that there seems to be a general consensus at the moment that it is the, the commercial and practical realities will dictate that the UK will broadly follow the EU lead in a number of areas. Um, there's been a very interesting consultation amongst the medical industry in the UK recently about proposed future EU um, directives and the industry overwhelmingly came back and said, well, thank you very much. We would actually like to have exactly the same regulation to the EU because we are selling to the EU. So, so there probably isn't going to be that much of an sort of independent um, legislative program coming out of this. We'll see. Um, looking at the competition law, I bet we're really, really thin on the ground. Uh, we have a, it's, it is clear that the that UK will going forward will require separate filing for merger clearance. So that's going to be a separate process. Um, how much that's going to be actually affect because there's a number of parties that you have to file now anyway in a large, larger, larger mergers. Probably there's also a suspicion that there's going to be a um, tendency towards. Um, not allowing politically unpopular takeovers and acquisitions taking place if they are affecting the national interest to iconic businesses or brands. That could be, there's a sort of a populistic element of that that, that, that could happen, we don't know. Um, but talking to, um, to competition law practitioners in the UK, um, it does not seem that there's a, any sort of desire on the government level, to develop an in, in independent competition law um, a, a policy. So probably, broadly, the same things will continue as before. I think that's sort of the best I can give. This is all speculation, but that's the best I, I can give to you today. A, um, um, looking at the, the practical side of um, EU law practice, because many of you are in private practice, I think one of the interesting things is what's going to happen to the large London-based teams of lawyers working on EU law. Um, most of the people I know who are, in the, who, are, who are competition lawyers in London are ardent Remainers. 
they are probably the strongest supporters of EU, EU in the uh, in the country and do not really want to become domestic UK competition lawyers. And also, the demand for a uh, for services done for domestically will be a fraction of what currently the large law firms in competition law practices provide. So that's going to be an interesting situation. Where do these people go? Many of them talk about moving to Berlin or moving moving abroad, just basically they could. Um, if they stay in London, there's also an interesting question about them losing the privilege in EU matters. And so there's been a mass movement of um, um, English qualified solicitors uh, requalifying in Ireland purely just in order to preserve their privilege and to be able to continue practice. But that's, I don't have an answer of what will happen to these big practices, but it is a, yeah, it's, I would assume they will probably go away and practice somewhere else. It won't, yeah. yeah. Um, so that's sort of what I would like to say. That's a, um, So thanks a lot for these really two very good inputs. I have one thought of uh, hearing to Eero and he mentions that there are a lot of qualified competition lawyers in the UK or in London probably some of the guys can join my authority <laughs> for more for more experience. So <laughs> probably we should discuss it on a palatial level. Take yourself on a plane and go out go out. <laughs> Hand back your car. One blame. <laughs> so thanks a lot for your input.